Hello, everybody. Welcome to the very first LFX Mentorship Showcase. Um, could we advance the slide? Um, my name is Shua Khan. I'm a Kernel Maintainer and Linux Fellow at the Linux Foundation. In this role at the Linux Foundation, I lead mentorships at LF, uh, which allows me to learn, share, at the same time, also um, design mentorship programs that empower others to do the same. Next slide, please. Um, next slide. So whenever we are, as, as beginners, when we try to learn a new area or trying to get into a new area, we have to start somewhere. Um, we are uh, always thinking about what we are passionate about, what, which project would we like. Um, next slide, please, Matt. Um, we are thinking about constantly, so where do we start? Where do we begin? Um, we're all faced with the same set of problems. Next slide. And once we decide the project we want to be get involved in, then next problem comes in. How do we get started? Um, next slide. And where we where are we? going to find the resources for us to be able to learn and who can help us. Next slide, please. Um, so once we figure out um, the project and how we want to get started and where are our resources, then the next problem comes in, who can help us? because the com communities um, um, look intimidating, code base looks daunting. And at this point, we are looking to see uh, where we go next. Next slide, please. Um, at LR Training, you can plan your learning, learning paths and several free courses and webinars are available uh, to explore um, what you want to do and learn as well um, basics and uh, more advanced training. Uh, in or at the LF training site. And you can also learn from experts um, in interactive webinars. Uh, LF Live series offers those, which are also free. Next slide, please. And if we have, once you figure out all of these things and you want to learn one on one, working with mentors um, on projects you can apply to the LFX mentorship programs and, and participate in the mentorship program and work on a project while getting paid. Next slide, please. Once you graduate, what next? At this point, we are connecting um, new graduates, graduates with people looking for talent. That is what we are doing today, um, having our graduates speak um, and share what they have done during their mentorship project and what they learned. Um, next slide, please. Before I hand it off to um, Harsh um, to talk about his project, and um, I would like to take a moment to, to recognize all our mentors that helped um, and volunteered their time and to train the next generation. Uh, well, thank you um, to all our mentors. Without mentors, we won't be able to do what we do. At this point, I will hand off uh, to Harsh to uh, present. So, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Harsh and I'm working as a blockchain developer at Ironworks. So the mentorship project that I've been working on is the integration of Aries and Fabric. Uh, like about the description, what Aries is, Aries is basically a wrapper uh, built around which uses Indy as a ledger and Ursa as a cryptography library. And it is, uh, Indy is specifically built for securing identities of an individual, uh, basically securing identities on the internet. So with Aries, uh, I can selectively disclose my, uh, like there are 
particular credentials which uh, an individual owns so the issuer issues that to the user and user can verify it to the verifier using uh, by disclosing certain information uh, which would come under selective disclosure and by not disclosing the other information that he or she does not want to disclose uh, that can happen through zero knowledge proof so now what the scenario is aries only supports indi as a ledger and most businesses today use fabric to build their blockchain solutions say for supply chain management or or for cbdc projects that are being implemented worldwide or uh, for energy trading uh, the businesses that develop these solutions they mostly use fabric as a ledger and what they want is they want to verify some or the other kind of identity in their use case so what they would do now is they would use fabric fabric blockchain for their main purpose use case for supply chain management and indi for managing identities but they don't want to do that and they want to use only one ledger for managing everything so therefore this project comes up where wherein the businesses can use aries framework javascript and integrate it with fabric to verify those identities okay so the objectives that i had to do i had to implement in this project was to write a chain code and a module chain code would get deployed in the fabric and module would be part of afj then i had to write the test cases that would test the module's interaction with the ledger and finally i had to do a demo of issuance and verification so i have uh, like the chain code for that i needed to know what kind of transactions uh, indi supports now so so indi right now has a total of six transactions uh, name transaction schema credential definition uh, cre uh, revocation registry entry revocation registry definition and attrib transaction so i had to write a chain code that would support all these six transactions then a module was to be implemented in afj and then the test cases and demo this project enabled me to know how the indi ecosystem works like there are various parts to indi first of first of all first of them being how roles are being managed in indi there are certain roles like steward trustee network monitor and endorser so i had to study how how these roles can impact my solution as well as there is one more thing called as transaction author agreement i had to also study this anyhow we have not gone with implementing the rules and ta as of now i discussed with the open source community uh, of how we can do, go about this and they were also of the view that this particular use case of integrating aries with fabric right now doesn't require rules and taa right now so the next part being i have to support all the six transactions that goes to indi so i have to support all those and they should go to fabric Uh, also i had to know how the fabric network works and how docker containers manage the fabric network how their communication happens okay so right now uh, in our solution there are two wallets that we are being we are we are using one is indi wallet for managing the uh, secret and non secret records in the indi ecosystem like for managing credential records or a connection record between a issuer between an issuer and user all these records are being kept in indi wallet and the fabric wallet contains the identities that are being used by the peer of the fabric network to uh, that are, that is being used by the client application of the fabric network to connect with the peer of the fabric network so the fabric related identities are kept in fabric wallet and the indi related identity uh, verification uh, main uh, records are kept in indi wallet so uh, we can we we would have to integrate those wallet into one and this is one of the use case that we are going to do the second one being uh, afj right now only supports dead schema and cred def transaction we need to uh, whenever the revocation transactions are being added we can also add those transaction in the chain code as well as in the module 
uh, going forward we would also try to support afj with other ledgers if the need arises so i would show you a demo okay so this is where my fabric network is running uh, here i have uh, installed packaged and installed the chain code on peers and here you can see the logs of one of the peers so you can see that uh, till five blocks uh, there are in my blockchain network as of now so i would just run the test case so now what this would do is this would write three transactions from afj to fabric network those being a dead transaction which we also call as nim transaction schema transaction and cred def transaction so what you can see you would see logs in uh, logs in this console that would go till three blocks more being added to the network so yes it's working So it has built a wallet right now. Okay, here you can see that one test case has passed. and the sixth block has come into the network now we will see one more test case being passed so that was the block of dead transaction now you can see that two test cases have passed and now the seventh block has come into the network this is the block for schema transaction and then let the cred credential definition transaction block come in Okay, now you can see the eighth block come in, and that is the block for cred def transaction. All the three test cases have passed, and the dead schema and cred def have been registered to the ledger. Similarly, what we can do is we can add support for revocation registry entry, revocation registry definition, as well as attrib transaction, and once uh, this is done we can support full ssi use case with fabric starting from issuance of credential till verification until revo also we would be able to support revocation of credentials and we can then verify if the credential is is uh, 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 if the credential is valid or not so that's it from my side thank you yep hello everyone my name is navin and today i'll be talking about how did i get started with contributing to pieces of system uh so who am i i am a software engineer working at hasura and i personally like to think close to the hardware level so system programming is something that is close to my heart and 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 and, and yeah to put it in a brief some i'm just an i confused human and okay now let's see why did i even want to start or rather participate in the tennis tournament mentorship program right so there were three reasons the first was i have always been interested in the lower layers of the computer architecture and i wanted to experience what it feels like like 
to be at the layer where where like we are away from most of the abstractions and computer does what you tell it to, right? So I wanted to experience what it actually feels like. And Linux kernel was fit the perfect spot, and I wanted to contribute to it. And second, I want to understand how large open source projects work together, like how people collaborate with each other and how the asynchronous communications happen. And third, I had this childish fantasy to see my work, including the Linux kernel. I mean, it's a place where all the legends work, right? So I just want it to be the thing. Uh, so that's the reason I was motivated to apply for the Linux kernel mentorship program. So uh, what did I work at? What did I work on? So I applied to Linux kernel project for, under the PCI subsystem, and I was mentored by Bijon Hel Helgas. So to give you a an, uh, to give a brief context of what PCI is, PCI is basically this peripheral component interconnect. That is like uh, whenever you open up your CPU, you, you see the small slots where you pick up, fix up your graphic card or memory or hard drives and everything, right? So that's that's the slot which is called as a PCI local bus. And this is the bus which allows the computer to communicate with this external physical devices. Now, now your OS needs to interact to these physical devices, right? How do they interact? With? The code which makes this happen is nothing but the PCI subsystem. Now, so PC subsystem is basically the code which helps these external devices communicate with your computer. Now, when we have these physical devices connected to a software, errors are bound to happen because we don't live in an ideal world. And these errors is also handled by the, our PCI code. So we have, so the PCI subsystem basically logs the errors which the third party devices give us. And my project basically was to make this error diagnosis more easier. And there were lots of long-standing defects, which I participated in, I, mean, I wish I was responsible to fix for. So the task, so, so to summarize, I worked on the PCI header and link code for the PCI subsystem. And the tasks that I worked were basically this, uh, this set of tasks which, which, which you see on the screen. There are like three tasks which are very close to my heart. The first one was this unified PCI error response checking. So what is it? So as I said before, when devices talk to the computer, uh, errors bound are bound to happen, right? So when there are different kinds of devices, you have different controllers. That means you have a mouse. So mouse can have a different controller. Um, I mean, this, this example might be wrong, but still, I'll just to put into perspective. So there, there will be different companies of mouses and there'll be different controller drivers for each mouses. Now, whenever any error happened, it was a responsibility for the controller driver to actually, I mean, whenever any read error happens or write error happens, it was the responsibility of the controller driver to actually set the error or to tell the computer that uh, there has been, uh, there, the error has been occurred. But with this patch, what, what happened is a PCI code, it now takes up the responsibility of, uh, of of setting this error and relieves the controller drivers from this task, right? So that was uh, my first task, which which was my, which was to unify the errors response checking. And the second task was to implement the key unit test for the PCI resource assignment. So what? Uh, so so the reason this spawned up was because. Uh, Bijan found out lots of people when they wanted to test out the resource allocation thing. Uh, the, the testers had to write uh, manually, enter the trace statements and send back to the user. User had to test it, then revert back, then there were lots of changes, so on and so forth. But if you had this key unit test, uh, but having this key unit test fixture would help us, the, would, would help us save this time of communicating with the user. Users. So this KMD test is something which is close to my heart because I spend majority of my time in reading about uh, the PCI, uh, the, the, uh, the, the code which actually makes the PCI run. So that's the second thing. And the third thing is, uh, yeah, yeah, these are the two things which I like. And for the people who actually would like to see how to get started with PCI subsystem, I actually wrote a blog, uh, which which might help you because I personally had lots of hair pulling moments when I had to read through a lot of spec sheets and configurations and everything. And this was full of, it's PCI subsystem is very huge, right? So uh, this blog might help you, it's, this blog might help you get started with how to contribute to PCI subsystem. And then, yep. Yeah, and the last thing which I personally worked on was my patience. 
because I know that I am impatient when it comes to getting reviews for the uh, uh, for my batches, right? And so it was really hard for me in the initial stages to restrict myself or restrain myself to keep pinging maintenance with the reviews, which is the wrong thing to do. So yeah, so that's something that I worked on. And what are the things that I learned? So the first thing that which I wanted to learn was how the open source projects work, or how large open source projects work. So I learned about how the kernel development system work, how, like what is the workflow of the kernel development system, right? Like how how do I how do I make patches? How do I send the patches? And all of this is using this we uh, um, send the patches via mails and stuff. So that was a really nice, exciting thing to learn because I've been used to only using Google Gmails or any other GUI uh, mail clients. But using, I mean, learning about development and the workflow really helped me understand that there are so many possibilities and easier ways to actually change my personal workflow too. And the second thing that I learned is about the entire protocols of PCS subsystems, right? They're like, uh, like, like in, in each device, they, uh, there are different kind of registers and how do they interact and different spec sheets and then there's advanced reporting and all the stuff. So it was really exciting to read the spec sheets and see that what each, uh, like each block of a register can actually do when each register does indeed have a specific function. And the third thing was about how, how do we compile or cross compile a, your code for different architectures and stuff. So, yep, so these are three things. One was the development workflow and this and learning about PCS subsystem and kernel compilation. And then, okay, so what was my mentorship experience like? So, okay, so let me just go back. Let me just go past. I actually understood or rather learned about mental like, like there's a program called as Linux on a mentorship program during this open source summit in 2019. And that's when that's that the program kind of stuck close to me. And I really wanted to apply to it. So when I applied in 2019, I was very really focused on my application. So I didn't get through it. But I really would like to thank Shoa, Shoa for making the application process so exciting that even though I didn't get selected into it, I was able to take away a lot of uh, knowledge from there. So I know it, and I'm having that application process really takes time. I really want to thank Shaw for making that application process, which made me, which inspired me to reapply again this year because I had lots of time with work from home and stuff. So this year I just wanted to apply because uh, for the sake of applying, right? I mean, I mean, okay, how to, I mean, not for the sake of applying, I just wanted to, I, I knew that the application process would be fun. So I wanted to pass my time. And then I just, when I started doing the application process, the different tasks were of different uh, various difficulties and doing all of them kind of made me more interested. And then I got into full zone of applying to this uh, mentorship. And then after doing all the thing, I did get selected. And once I got selected, I had just three phases of my mentorship. The first thing was I was really, really worried. I mean, because I didn't expect myself to get selected, right? And then I didn't expect myself. And there was, and then the and kernel is like, I mean, it's, I mean, the perception that I had was kernel mentorship, like kernel development would be really hard and the community, community might not be beginner friendly. And these are all the kind of myths that I read or heard about. But to be really frank, those are really myths. They're, they're not the facts. And, and I had really blast with this mentorship because my mentor was Bijon Helvis and he's really awesome. And I, I, I exchanged like long emails with him talking about how to... Uh, implement my task and Pijon was really patient with replying back and that really cleared a lot of things up. So uh, my things really went from being worried that I might not be able to do it to being, okay, this might be possible that I might be capable and then wow, like ending that, I finally realized that this mentorship program really grows you as a person, right? From being under confident to being confident that, okay, that Mentorship, the, like develop, like contributing to kernel is not hard as long as you're persistent and as long as you do what you're supposed, like as long as you give your best. So yeah, so that was my mentorship experience, and I would like to thank again my mentors Bijan and Shua for being the support system and helping me whenever I do get stuck. And what are my aspirations? What do I want to do next? Uh, I really want to get 
more detail in the system level programming because I have always been saying that I like it, but I've never got the, I've been lazy enough not to actually get into it. But this mentorship program actually started my vehicle, right? I started my vehicle and I really wanted to, I really want to explore more and get into deeper with system level programming. And then, yep, I would like to improve my, my skills to the level of the people that I've interacted with. And then finally, be capable of becoming a kernel developer as a full job. So that was my aspirations. And that's it. Thank you, everyone. And these are my contact slide. And that's it. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. So uh, I am Puranjay Mohan, and I am a senior year student in India. I am pursuing an engineering degree. And today I'll be talking about supporting PCI latency tolerance reporting in the Linux kernel. And uh, even I didn't know the meaning of these words before I applied. So, so uh, something about me, I'm really passionate about the hardware software interface and uh, things like operating systems, embedded systems, system software, computer architecture, etc. So this is my first Arduino Uno, which I bought in my seventh grade. Uh, this is a image from 2012. So uh now i would like to tell you how i got into the linux kernel and uh how uh i started with all this so initially i wanted to learn about computers and digital electronics and how everything works so in that a very important part was the operating system and uh, i wanted to learn how an operating system is built and how uh it interacts with the hardware so Linux came in because Linux is open source. I can see its code and try to understand how different parts of it work. So that's how I got into Linux kernel development. And uh, then I got to know about Linux kernel mentorship program and applied to it to get some experience and uh, to learn how things work. So uh, this is the overview of my project. So my project was also related to the PCI subsystem. Uh, as the previous speaker uh, has already introduced the PCI subsystem, I'm happy that I'm talking after him. So uh, my project was related to the power management of the PCI subsystem. So uh, like every system which uh, works on electricity, we need to save the power. So, so there are methods to keep uh, the devices in low power modes when they are not used. One of them is putting the device into L1.2 power mode, which is the lowest power mode. But if a device has to go into this mode, then it will uh, take some time for it to come back to the normal mode. So that is called the exit latency. So if we want to put a device into this mode, we need to make sure that its latency requirements are not uh, more than the latency that is required to come back from the this mode. So if something like a GPU wants uh, to work very fast, then if we put it into a low power mode and then it comes back, it'll take some time and it'll make it slow. So my project was uh, related to calculating the latencies and then summing it, them up and programming them into the PCI structures. So uh, Basically, because latencies uh, are added, so if something is, uh, if we have like three uh, things, they are stacked one after one. So the time taken for a message to go through them will be the sum of the distances between them. So that is how uh, it happens in PCI also. So in PCI subsystem, the CPU has this root complex and after that, all different PCI or PCI express uh, endpoints are connected. So in that case, we can make a tree like structure, uh, as you can see on the right side in the image. So an endpoint could be connected to a switch, which could be connected to another switch, and then it will reach the root complex. So basically what I did in my project is whenever an endpoint is uh, enumerated, we go through the endpoint till the root complex and we add all the latencies and then program it into the endpoint structure. So to find out the latencies, there is something called device specific methods, which are implemented by PCI endpoints. So uh, using those device specific methods, I could get the latency of each device. 
and then submit and program it to the endpoint. And uh, when it is programmed after that, that value will be used to check that if uh, this device can be put into low power mode or not. So this, this thing is done by uh, the BIOS also, but that is on the boot up as PCI supports hot plug devices also. So when a device is hot plugged, then the BIOS uh, does not program it and the kernel has to do it. So now I would like to talk about the things that I learned. So the first thing is that I learned about Linux kernel compilation and testing. Uh, in the course of uh, working on this project, I had to compile the kernel many times and do modifications to it and uh, also do it through custom configurations. So that's what I did. And I, I, got, I got very good at uh, like keeping four or five kernels in my computer and then testing them on the go. Then, uh, then I also found out how to log the results when a kernel panics or when it stops or not works, then we should know why it is not working. Uh, so the next thing is the PCI subsystem as my project was related to PCI. I had to learn the PCI protocol and different things that are uh, like the device specific methods as I talked about the configuration space, the capabilities. So, and uh, I was able to add code to the PCI code base and then uh, make it work. So to do that, I had to add two new functions to the code base. One was to find the latency and another was to add it and uh, program it. The next thing that I learned is the kernel development flow and how to use Git to make the patches, send it to mailing list. And when a, reviews, a reviewer asked us to change it, then we had to make the changes and send the new patches, do the versioning of the patches and everything. So that was very good. Even uh, this helped me to uh, do other contributions to other open source projects also. So now I would like to talk about my mentoring experience. So I guess this was the main part of Linux kernel mentorship program. I was mentored by Bjorn Helgas, who is the PCI subsystem maintainer. And uh, the process was quite enjoyable and enriching. Like we used to chat every day on IRC and like he even shared code snippets with me when I used to get stuck. And I used to send all my patches to him before sending them to the mailing list because if I send something wrong on the mailing list, I could get uh, like backlash from the other developers. So Beyond helped me by first uh, pointing out my mistakes in it itself. And uh, then like, because this was a complex project, initially I was very much scared and because Beyond was with me, he could help me. And then I was able to do a few things which alone I would not be able to do. And like, we are still connected. And after that, I started working on another project with his help in the PCI subsystem itself. So like I faced a few challenges earlier, uh, like in the first uh, Linux kernel mentorship program, which was when it was first uh, uh, initialized. At that time also I applied in the PCI project only, but I ended up withdrawing because I was scared that I won't be able to complete the project. And uh, like, so I, made the application, did everything, but then I dropped off and didn't submit it. So after that, I talked to one of my friends who was going through the mentorship and I got the confidence and I applied this time and got selected. So this is uh, very good for me that I was not able to do it before, but now I got through it. This is only because uh, like we get both technical and interpersonal mentorship to succeed in the project and uh, to keep contributing. So in this, uh, Shua and Beyond both helped me uh, very much. So now I would to like to say what happened after LKM. So after Linux kernel mentorship program, I got enough skills and experience to use Git and to compile the kernel. And so then I got selected for Google Summer of Code with the Linux Foundation itself. In that, my project was uh, related to IIO subsystem and uh, sensors. So I wrote sensor for a, an, an accelerometer and then upstream that. So after LKMP and GSOC, I got an internship offer from Texas Instruments and I have started yesterday only there. So it helped me in every way possible. Now my aspirations are to attend a physical conference and give a talk there. And I, I really want to meet 
other maintainers and especially beyond who is my who was my mentor i want to meet linus towards get a few images with him uh, greg and jonathan and others who have helped me uh, shua also and i i really want to turn this passion slash hobby into a full time career so uh, you can contact me at these links and uh, this is the link to all the code that i have produced in the in the mentorship program and so this was all from my side thank you Hello everybody. My name is Sharon Kwech from Kenya, and today I'm going to talk about my experience as an LFX mentee for the Tremo project last summer. So my project entails redesigning Tremo's website uh, with uh, emphasis on uh, improving user experience and also its web presence. But in order to do that, there are a lot of decisions that had to be made and were eventually made by my, my, myself and the mentors. And uh, that's what I'm going to talk about today. But first, uh, I'll tell you a little bit about me and why I, I, I was interested in the LFX uh, mentorship program. And that's because of its emphasis on support for first time developer, open source developers. And yeah, so I, I do not have a uh, background in technology, studied economics and statistics at the University of Nairobi. And I was just uh, still t uh, teaching myself, learning on my own how to code. And I thought that this would be a good opportunity to to, to go faster. And I knew it was, it was overwhelming. I was totally lost and I needed guidance, which I have received so far from my mentors at Shamo. So uh, Trema is a, is a small project, an early stage uh, event processing system, and it's a sun, uh, CSF sandbox project that became open source just recently in 2020. You, you can read more about it. Um, there's a, a, a link on the slide. And so my goal, like I said before, was to redesign the website, uh, which at the time was, uh, well, first of all, uh, the, the 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 team because it was still a small project and uh, trying to uh, put the documentation all the content out there as fast as possible it became a bit overwhelming and scattered and there were uh on, on different platforms for example the docs one um, mk docs uh the website was on hugo so the first thing for, uh, for me to do was to uh, unify all this uh, different content forms in one platform. And then after that, then uh, redesign it, make it beautiful and, and, and user friendly. So uh, some of the criteria that we're looking at was uh, an easy to navigate uh, theme. Uh, so we're looking for smooth navigation between you know the different sections of the website, from the docs to the RFCs. Yeah, also, we wanted uh, a platform a platform or a framework that supported documentation versioning that we served Markdown, which was already being used because of its ease of use. So, um, also, other things we're looking at for syntax highlighting and just something that was both user friendly and, yeah, it had. Uh, the, the things we're looking for. So uh, the first month was just familiar, getting myself familiar with the project. So I would meet with my mentors and they, they would, because I was pretty new to Git, uh, GitHub and the Git workflow. So the first, especially the first week, that was the main thing I learned. Uh, I also learned about community co collaboration, uh, writing good pull requests, facing good uh, GitHub issues, a lot of not, not taking, which I learned was a skill. Yeah, so because, like I said earlier, there were a lot of repositories. There was the, the main, for the main website on the Hugo repository, there, were, there was the docs repository, the RFCs repository. So I was just getting familiar with all this and then for that, I analyzed the old website for any possible areas of improvement because 
uh, before I even started working on the project. Uh, the team had already uh, identified things that I, I was supposed to work on, but they valued my fresh eyes. And so I, 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 I analyzed it and came up with a few uh, possible areas of improvement which you can read uh, at your own time. There's a link over there. So, and then after that, uh, the team really values feedback from the community. And so we requested feedback from the CNCF and from the other members of the, of the community, which, which was very helpful and helped us to find a way forward and know what, what to consider from their own. So uh, the second month, we tested a lot, lot of uh, frameworks. For example, uh, Hugo, Docusaurus, Zola, Sphinx, so many using some criteria, uh, some of which I've already mentioned. For example, support for syntax highlights in Markdown, um, documentation versioning, and of course, the other more specific uh, criteria, for example, Hugo was that is endorsed by CNCF, by CNCF because that's what they use, so it should be better for us to use it. But again, for that, some other reasons, we were not able to use it. Uh, Docusaurus has uh, the dark mode, light mode uh, functionality, for example, which was not uh, which was not available in the other platforms, and it's something that we found out that the community would like. So we had to weigh all these options and then come up with a, with a uh, decision of what to use. Because, I mean, we couldn't have pleased everyone, but at least we were confident that it was the right uh, decision because we, we analyzed it and we, we looked at both the pros and the cons. There's a summary on the link on the slide that you can look at later. So yeah, we finally we selected the users, and uh, this this uh, decision making phase was very important because I learned a lot of things about working in a community. For example, that a decision does not have to be perfect; it has to be good enough. It does not ha have to be the uh, the best solution, the technically best solution, but it has to be the right solution for your specific uh, project for a specific situation. So midway through my my mentorship, I had learned so much. I, I couldn't be happier. I, I couldn't still believe it that I had been even selected and that I was learning all this and I had this opportunity. So I wrote about it. I wrote about my experience and my excitement, which you can find on this blog post. Okay, on to the third phase, where now after we had made a decision to use DocuSaurus, it was we started uh, the implementation, setting up and configuring the servers, migrating the, the, the different content forms, the RFCs, the docs, the websites from from the uh, Hugo and MK docs repositories, and to now the docuseries repository. Then after that, uh, we enabled uh, the, the features, for example, blog, the blog feature, which also was very important, an important criteria, documentation versioning, dark mode, search pattern. Yeah, and yeah, syntax highlighting, all that. Uh, then when we were confident that it was working and we had shared uh, the, the, we had shared the repository with the other members of the community for feedback and they liked it, so now we just, it was the final touches, the design and the layout. And yeah, then after that, uh, we de uh, deployed the website. Uh, there's a link to the, uh, the repository down there. And one thing I learned from this phase was, again, the benefits of early feedback from the community, from all the people involved because it just makes things go faster and then you, you don't have you don't have to uh, you know finish the project and then start all over again because just because you didn't 
request for any feedback. It can be really helpful in any project. And yeah. So this is how the website currently looks like. This is the homepage. As you can see, there's the, the docs, the blogs, the blog uh, already up there. There's the versioning, there's, there's a doc, the doc, okay. The doc mode is not visible. There's a dark mode uh, switch to toggle, dark mode, light mode to toggle. There's a search button. Yeah. And that's the docs with the, lit, the latest version. RFC is. Yeah. So, onto my mentoring experience, uh, I had my, the best mentor I could have asked for, Heinz Keys, uh, with the help of. Derek and Matthias, but I work with them mostly with Heinz. And we, we met twice or thrice a week. And I liked his approach because mostly he didn't always tell me just what to do, but he gave me a chance to, to work out problems on my own. And uh, yeah, and he would maybe offer some a few suggestions, some resources to help me come up with uh, solutions, but he did not understand which, which I like because I got to uh, I got to learn a lot during the process and to find different ways of, of reaching on the same solution, choosing which one is the best way. That that, that was a great great experience. Uh, another thing that I was outstanding was the, was that he exposed me to other members of the community because I, naturally I, I I'm not very good at networking people, especially online and meeting and starting conversations. But with his help, it was easier to reach out to other members of the community and and, and talk to them, ask for help. And also the CNCF Check Docs team introduced me to, 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 to them to Celeste Holden was very helpful uh, with the project and the maintainer circle also who pointed out a few things that you could do and it was, it was generally it was really fun, challenging. It was a lot of them, which appreciate. So thank you very much, Heinz. Uh, on to the, uh, the, the highlights of my mentorship, and the surprises. Uh, first of all, I was very surprised to learn uh, about the reason I was selected. No, I was, I did not expect to be selected at all because I I did not have a lot of skills. Uh, I had not worked on a lot of projects. I did not have a uh, background in technology, but I was still selected anyway. And I was surprised. I was it was interesting to learn that because of my C, not my CV, but my uh, cover letter, just the design and the wording. And that was enough to, 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 to make them know that they would use it would uh, those skills would be helpful in the web design and the documentation part of the project. And I mean it did. <laughs> I was very surprised to learn that. And oh, it was also nice that everyone was helpful and everyone was so nice uh, at Strama and at uh, the CNCF meetings. Also uh, I got an opportunity to attend the Open Source Summit in KubeCon, North America last year uh, through the uh, Linux Foundation's Diversity Scholarship, although I was not able to attend because of COVID, but still it was a, it was an interest, it was a good opportunity and I, I, I'm grateful. I was still able to attend virtually anyway. <laughs> and another, a great thing that happened was that after my three month mentorship, the, the trauma team uh, wanted to retain me as, as, a, as a maintainer for the docs. And <laughs> it's a, it was surprising, it still is, but I mean, it's, it's great that, it's great that, I mean, three months ago, I didn't know what I was doing and now, you know, it's nice. Uh, another thing was that even after the end of the three months, after the end of the mentorship, 
the, the team always told us that that was not the end of what it was not the end of the mentorship. I mean, they could always help. They can always help even right now. Uh, if you need any guidance, any assistance, they're always ready to help as, uh, as, much, as, they, as, as much as they can. And also through uh, my mentorship at Shrema, I was able to get a recommendation to work on the project I'm currently working on right now at Benu uh, in Berlin. Thanks to uh, Derek, who is uh, uh, part of the chairman team. So, uh, what next for me? What I hope for is just uh, in the short term to continue uh, making Trema's documentation better uh, with the help of Celeste's review. And uh, Celeste from the CNCF actually made wrote us a very impressive review and a very thorough review, which I think if implemented could make uh, documentation really, really awesome. So that's what I hope to do. And and also uh, to become more outgoing maybe and involved with the community and open source. And also in the same breath, um, maybe speak at, um, an in-person conference because to overcome my fear of public speaking because I'm, as you can see, I'm kind of very nervous right now, <laughs> but I hope to become better and yeah, I hope to speak at Kim Content Street too. And one thing I, I really want to do is to perhaps mentor someone else, even a little bit, even half as much as I was meant to Chama, I think that could make a big difference in his life that it has made in mine. So this is, uh, in case you want to contact me, you can find here in my email. Uh, on Chama's Discord server is SKH and on my blog. Uh, I'd like to thank the Linux Foundation for this opportunity. It's really life-changing opportunity. I thank everyone involved, the CNCF team, Celeste and the tech devs team, the maintainer circle. Thank you very much. Uh, also the chairman team. I cannot thank them enough. They've been really supportive and inclusive. And <laughs> thank you so much, Heinz, Dirk, Matthias, Natalie, and Anna. And in general, the whole of the chairman community. Thank you very much for welcoming me for continuing being nice and, and great. Thank you so much. All right. So, hello everyone, and welcome to my showcase of known as a plugin system in Rust. So, I'm Mario. I'm a last year computer science student in the University of Zaragoza, which is in Spain. And I've always loved open source. I've been involved in many projects of my own, and also others out there. And I wanted to get some more real world experience in, in terms of programming. So, I thought this mentorship combined combined the best of both worlds, and that's why I joined it. For the, for the project, I worked with Tremor, which is basically an EPS, an event processing system. And it intends to be pretty fast and it has lots of uh, cool features for the most basic operations, such as pattern matching, filtering, and transformation. The, for those that aren't familiar with an EPS, the typical brain example would be a system where you have multiple applications with logs in different formats or even different protocols. And you want to transform them um, and process them uh, so that they can be outputted into, into your database for later analysis, maybe. So that would be perfectly possible with Tremor. But that was the boring example. Uh, the, the, the limit is your imagination, basically. So uh, another example would be to take discrete commands as input, uh, transform them uh, and filter them however is needed, and then output them uh, as Spotify commands to control your Spotify player, for example. Uh, so yeah, why a plugin system in the first place? Well, the main issue here in the Tremor team was compilation times. When I first tried to compile the project, uh, it took me over seven minutes on my laptop and it was only going to get worse. Uh, even in the case of incremental changes, it was like 10 seconds. So it's not really a good developer experience. Another good thing that comes with plugin systems is modularity. It's a good idea to be able to decouple the deployment of the executable or the runtime and all of its components. Uh, some things are just updated more regularly than others, or it's just good to be able to treat them uh, separately, right? And the last thing would be maybe to learn from others. Uh, there are other major projects with similar requirements as Tremor, such as Nginx or Apache, 
and they have been benefiting from a plugin, plugin system for a long time now. So it's a good idea to at least try it out and see how, how it works. And I also wanted to address uh, why they're choosing the path pane uh, part of the title. That's uh, It's a bit of an exaggeration, but there are basically many ways to implement a plugin system. Uh, uh, but yeah, after some tests uh, and some research, the only one that ended up being performant enough for Tremor's use case is the one that's called dynamic loading, which is actually perfectly, perfectly fine by itself. But the problem that wasn't so clear at the beginning is that it's not super easy to do with Rust. So uh, the thing is that uh, it is possible with Rust, but we basically have to resort to writing C with Rust. So it's nowhere near uh, as as idiomatic or, or as easy uh, or, or, or even safe. So, but yeah, in the end, I, I, I got it working. I'm, I'm super happy that I'm able to, to run the, the project and compile it in the first place. Uh, it's far from perfect, but and it's, it's still not in production, but I think it's a good basis for what the plugin system could look like in the future. And also the usability, as I was saying, it didn't end up being as bad as I thought, even though the code uh, and the concept is more or less low level. And uh, I was using C after all, but with enough macros, abstractions, and tooling, it does get a bit better. And the last thing that, that I really liked about the mentorship is that, that I was able to contribute to many upstream dependencies. Uh, I wasn't really expecting so much of it, uh, and I'm very happy for that I, I got to help a bit the open source Rust community. I learned lots of uh, lots of skills in, in the mentorship as well. Uh, one of them was researching my own. I did know about Rust in the beginning, but I had no clue how a plugin system could be implemented or, or what dynamic loading was. So uh, I had to figure figure it out uh, by myself. And this was also in part possible thanks to note taking. Uh, everything that I was researching uh, and learning uh, and my entire progress is written down on the blog that I created for when I started the mentorship, you can see the link there. And yeah, I was writing everything in there and it was not only useful for me because it helped me uh, organize my thoughts and, and remember things that I had done in the past, but also for others. If anyone else wants to implement a plugin system uh, in Rust in the future, I'm sure uh, my blog posts will be super useful to them. And it was even useful for my mentors because they were able to, to track more or less what I was doing at the moment. So I would recommend anyone to to do something, uh, all of the mentees watching this to do something similar, maybe at sm at smaller case uh, scale or, or whatever, but take notes definitely. I also learned lots of programming itself. Uh, apart from the prototype and the final implementation that I wrote, I had never really gotten into such a scary and huge code base as Tremors. So it's good that I was finally be able to do so. And the last thing, we, the last thing would be maybe organization. At first, the task was more or less simple, so. All of, everything that I had to do was more or less listed in the issues or the pull requests related to, to the plugin system, but I ended up uh, resorting to, to a proper organization method that's called Kanbans. And it helped me organize uh, what I, the, tasks that, the tasks that I had already done, the one that, that I was doing at the moment, and the, the ones that I, I was going to do in the past, in the future, sorry. And so yeah, skills are nice, but the experience is the most important part after all. So in terms of the development, Instagram more or less explains uh, how it went for me. So I started by trying to learn as much as possible about, about the topic. And then this was actually the lengthiest part of the mentorship, which I didn't really expect. But yeah, more or less, I, once I was confident enough with the topic of uh, plugin systems, I tried a, a new approach. Uh, and I, I wrote it in self-contained uh, smaller uh, experiments because I didn't really want, as I said, like the tremor code base was a bit scary at the beginning. So I tried to do it at a smaller scale. Uh, and and more or less, once more or less that was working, I tried to move on to the tremor code base. But it was good, I think, to be able to, to do uh, some experiments before. Uh, and, and yeah, uh, I tried to move on to the, to the tremor code base. And once more or less uh, it was working, uh, I actually went to failure. Uh, Actually, actually, catastrophic failure. But yeah, uh, like you learn from it. Uh, if this approach doesn't work, you can maybe try something different. You can figure out what went wrong, how to improve it. It's part of the game. And eventually it's a bit of a cycle for a few times. Uh, you fail and you learn from it. And once you more or less uh, know how it works, you eventually arrive to, that's, to something that's good enough or uh, success. So my advice to the mentees would be as well to learn from your mistakes, failures, but to success for sure. In terms of communication, my mentors were key as well. Uh, Matthias was the official one. 
but I also got tons of help from Derek and Hines. And basically anyone in the Discord server as well who were trying to, to help me out to understand how, how Tremor worked and how the plugin system could be implemented. So yeah, another advice is to take advantage of your mentors because, because they are there for you and they want you to succeed, of course. So what's next? Well, in the short term, uh, I actually decided to make this my final year project. Uh, and that's kind of the beauty of open source, right? Uh, even after you're done with the, your project, you can continue contributing to, to it. Uh, and that's what I, what, what I will be working on uh, for a few next uh, months, maybe uh, it's getting just getting the, the plugin system ready for deployment, polishing it, uh, running some benchmarks, some tests, and just getting it a, a bit better. And in the long term, I think Tremor helped me a lot as well. Uh, I, I, I will, uh, for me, my problem was that I was uh, always into computer science, but I never really knew what field I was into or like uh, what my future job could actually look like. And I think Tremor is a good example of that because it's uh, it's got lots of things that I really liked. Uh, one of them being really open source friendly, of course. He also had a really healthy work-life balance and they were really open-minded and very inclusive. Uh, and the topic as well is very interesting to me. It's more or less on the backend side of things and it's low level-ish coding, not super low level, but still interesting enough uh, to me. So that's more or less what, I, what I'll be looking for uh, once I graduate. And so, yeah, uh, last thanks to, to everyone, basically uh, to the Rust Open Source community for all of those libraries, uh, all of those tutorials, and uh, all of that help in implementing the plugin system. All the Tremorites out there in the Discord server and everywhere for the bearing with me and trying to, to help me understand Tremor and also the Langlois Foundation for making this possible in the first place. So, yeah. Any questions, you can leave them later and I'll answer. Hello, everyone. My name is Santiago. And I have recently finished my PhD and I am currently working in data analysis and information management group of, of SEID, a research center in Basque country that's part of the University of Navarra. First of all, I would like to thank two project mentors and the Linux Foundation for the opportunity to present the work, the use of NLB and DLT to enable the digitalization of the telecom roaming agreement as part of the Upper Layer um, Mentorship uh, 2021 program. Um, you can see the Menti Project presentation and another presentation that we did as part of the Hyperlayer Telecom Group presentation uh, on the lead set in the, in the slide footer. Now I will start with an overview of the roaming agreement concept. Roaming agreement operations ensure business continuity and ability to service access to the end customer across various technologies stack, including technologies like you know, 5G and IT. And the roaming agreement address the technical and commercial components uh, necessary to enable the service to a uh, roaming agreement customer. So that is constitute an essential part of the, of the business managing issues such as interoperation charge. Thinking like a roaming agreement are um, mainly a bilateral agreement with an established template provided by GCMA. Therefore, conducting dynamic and transparent roaming agreement drafting process ensure advantage for telco companies. The necessity of the pet comes from uh, the problem detected in the roaming agreement drafting process, which include, uh, first of all, that the roaming agreement negotiation manual is slow and untrustworthy. So the GCMA approach for the wholesale roaming agreement initiative is like a bit generalist in terms of negotiation and drafting of the roaming agreement, so it lacks of standardization. And uh, you know, this uh, a necessity to establish a framework that provides capabilities such as, you know, uh, first of all, provide the fine grain knowledge that digitalize the roaming agreement drafting process. And the second one is to promote the transfer negotiation process between uh, two miles networks operator. And that one is to ensure traceability in the roaming agreement drafting process. In this way, 
blockchain integrated with other technologies such as natural language processing can cover this capability. An overview of the project can be found in our first Medium article published as part of this project in the link showed in the footer of this slide. For this reason, the main project objectives are, first of all, to build a library that will capture the different variation and variables that construct a telecom roaming agreement, and to the proof of concept of a set of a smart contract that will automate the process of drafting and negotiation. The reference architecture of the project include not only uh, you know, the participant entities, but also the functionality that they perform throughout the application life cycle. First, the entities participant in the roaming agreement are composed by two mobile networks operators and the GC made as administrator. There are, there are functions that they perform in commons and functions like, you know, like the maintenance of the hyperledger fabric blockchain network and also the participation in the network consensus. But particularly, mobile networks operators negotiate and draft the roaming agreement among themselves, maintaining the privacy of the information and using the NLE engine to create a template which be used as part of drafting process. Uh, in addition, the GCMA is in charge of the registration of mobile networks operator, the network monitoring and the audit and accountability of the roaming agreement conducted between two mobile network operators. The application, the application life cycle is composed by four stages. The first phase starts when two mobile networks operator um, enable a roaming agreement principle throughout uh, you know, a document that could be shared with the GCMA as a, a central authority. At this point, GCMA can create the roaming agreement output template using you know, the NLB um, engine execution. The second phase, phase implies the registration of the mobile network operator. The third stage includes the ROM agreement drafting process. The fourth stage consists of the proposal and acceptance uh, to reach agreement. The two main components of the prior are, first of all, the NLB engine, and second one, the chain code. The overall architecture of the NLB engine is built over the infrastructure, establishing as input the agreement, draft, as well as the GCMA template. The processing layer is look uh, is uh, is identified as the NLP engine, which include as output the classification of article in a standard clause, variation, cost asset, cost cost asset text, variables using uh, the Amazon Comprehend tool. Detail of the NLB engine can be found in this in the article uh, medium called published as part of this project. This image illustrates part of the of methods that make up uh, uh, the shake up life cycle. The invocation of this method establishes the transition between different states of the chain code. This, transi this transition takes place at three application levels. First of all, at roaming agreement level, second one, at articles level, and finally at article level. Details of the chain code design can be found in the third medium article published as part of this project. The project implementation is based on a set of microservices using Docker infrastructure. It should be noted how GCMA is the administrator, the maintainer of a set of services, including front-end NLB engine, uh, you know, Kibana, Grafana, Prometheus, and the documentation of the API using Swear. Um, in second place, the two mobile networks operators include the functionality, the functionalities to maintain and monitor in the ledger. And one, in, one of the most uh, remarkable points of this project is the integration with other open source projects that belong to the Hyperlayer Mentorship Program, specifically the project um, analyzing Hyperlayer Fabric Ledger transaction and logs using Elasticsearch and Kibana. Uh, now it's coming. As you can see here, the transaction committing it to the ledger once the same code was installed and instantiated. Now the 
the attempt to access for the user failed because GCMA need to register it before. GCMA registered admin and user of the mobile network operator. User one is able now to register the mobile network operator. And as you can see, the transaction is committed to the ledger. Again, the user two now is able to register the second mobile network operator. And now you can see how the transaction is also committed into the ledger. The same mobile network operator now is able to propose a roaming agreement registration. As you can see now, the pipeline created can show the roaming agreement available. The roaming agreement proposal now need to be confirmed for the other mobile network operator. I'm the mobile network, network operator one. As you can see, the transaction committed to the ledger. And now the mobile network operator is able to propose an article based on the roaming agreement output template loaded from the NLB engine. You can see now how the status of the roaming agreement is changed. And also an article is included into the pipeline. One important thing is that the proposed chain cannot be accepted by the same mobile network operator that proposed it. Now the mobile network operator number two is able to propose changes. This one change, another change. And now the article status is updated as you can see in the article pipeline. Now the mobile network, network reader one can accept the proposition for this particular article. Now you can see the transaction coded into the ledger. Now the mobile network operator, one in this case, is able to add other articles. In this example, I will add two articles. This is one article, this is the second, the second article. Now you can see the article included into the pipeline. So, mobile network operator number one cannot accept its own change. So, mobile network operator number two can accept the proposed changes. This one accept. Okay, with just three article, with just article, mobile network operator number two, go to the pipeline and propose to reach an agreement. Finally, mobile number operator number one can accept the proposal and then the agreement is reached. Here you can see the last transaction committed into the ledger. Thank you very much. Thank you everybody for speaking and sharing your experiences. Thank you graduates. You did an awesome job. Next slide. Man. I would like to thank um, our sponsors that have consistently been sponsoring these programs, Red Hat, IBM, GitHub, and Intel. They have been with us since uh, 2019 supporting these programs. And we're able to uh, offer more projects and include and help train next generation of dollars. Thank you so much.
Thanks, everybody.